Welcome to the first speaker of Winter Quarter for the Huxley Speaker Series. I'm going to go push that button so it'll start warming up. So, um, great. I think you know, literally you've all figured out that the first assignment in. I haven't checked face or canvas, but I will. Um, but we'll be more those soon. If you have questions, talk to me after class or sometime. Um, today's speaker, we've got Janice Bauman from Huxley College on the Peninsula. Uh, I don't know how many of you even know about Huxley College and the Peninsula, but we have a whole other branch of Huxley College in the environment, teaching classes in Paulsville, Port Angeles, in Everett. Everett. Yes. Is there something else? Just those, those, those three. So, uh, anyway, you know, taking, uh, taking the good work and the, the education of the environment onto the Peninsula. But the program's been going for a few years, and we've got uh, a core faculty over there, including. Bauman, who's going to talk to us about trees and mine reclamation and fungi? And fungi. Yeah. Great. So please um, silence your cell phones, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Great. And it's all yours. Okay, great. And I tell you before, I, it, it, just to open this, yeah, is there any open. trick to that? Because no, no, I'm. No, just I think we're just. We're, yeah, it should be. We're not. Yeah, that's a trick. It doesn't work. Okay. okay should I just? I'll just get my Here, flash drive again. Can, no. Okay. <coughs> Yep. Oh, wow. There's nothing. Well, oh, okay. don't you uh, entertain yourself? I will. Sure. I can talk a little bit about yeah, the peninsulas. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, good. We, I, I love technology, and I depend, I depend on technology. Because as he said, is I'm with the peninsula program teaching at Port Angeles, in Polsbo, and in Everett all at the same time. So what we do is we have this interactive TV that links all of our students, our content, through a big screen like this, and then maybe a little square of, of me uh, on the campuses that I'm not there, and then I'm live once a week somewhere. Uh, so this is really a treat, talking to a live audience without having to depend on technology. And you've got it working. Like I said, I'm not much of a techie person. OK, well, thank you guys for, for coming. Thank you for the invite. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on for about 10 years now. I, I was counting up the years. I was like, whoa, I've been on this site for 10 years, and things are starting to get interesting. So uh, I do mine reclamation work in the Appalachian areas. So I have sites in, in Kentucky and in Ohio and in eastern Tennessee. Anyone from there ever been? It's a neat ecosystem. The, the, the deciduous forest of North America makes a really neat ecosystem. It's under pressure, of course, like any other ecosystem on this globe. In that case with Appalachia, we're talking about mining, both for gas and both for coal. So that gives us opportunity, right? I'm a restoration ecologist. I have to be optimistic or I will never get out of bed, right? So I can't see problems. I can only see solutions. And we're working on reclaiming some of these mine sites using a, a really interesting tree species. So I'll, I'll kind of hope I hooked you there. And today, I'll be talking about the interactions between beneficial ectomycorrhizal fungi, which I will define, okay, and the interactions of a pathogen called chestnut blight, Cryphonectria parasitica, and their influences on American chestnut in coal mine reclamation. I'm going to work on my titles. I'm like, oh, they're too long. Okay, so boom, we have two interactions, okay? One is a fungal mutualism, right? Mutualisms are not special uh, to fungi. Uh, however, mutualisms by definition is this interaction between two organisms where you're getting a positive interaction, usually. It could be a continuum as well, but generally when we think of our mutualisms, we're thinking of two different organisms that are working together and they're both benefiting, okay? So we have that power in our ecosystem and that could be this nice positive interaction or positive feedback throughout that building ecosystem, which it's a restored site, so we're in early succession, okay? So these mutualisms play a huge role in those plant communities and in establishment as well. And we have another fungal interaction, which is a pathogen. Okay, and pathogens are disease, okay? And that could be, for an example, a canker-forming fungus, okay, or fungi that form cankers. And they're very, very common in the ecosystem. Anytime you see this sort of cankered indentation in a bark of a tree, you have a, a, a fungal pathogen. Now it could just be a very calm pathogen, just interacting with the bark, the trees fighting back, and they're kind of in balance with one another. Or it could be a very detrimental pathogen. So that, too, 
has a continuum uh, on, on it with regard to that interaction of a negative feedback within that inter intersection or in that interaction within that ecosystem. Okay? So let's look a little closer at mycorrhizae. Okay? So mycorrhizae is that mutualism. So it's that symbiotic relationship that form between fungi and trees or plants, herbaceous plants, uh, depending whether it's ecto or endo. And I won't get into that much detail, but I will focus on ectomycorrhizae and define it in the next slide. But the big picture is, is that our mycorrhizae form this association between the plant roots and the tree. Okay, so the tree then becomes the carbon source for the fungus, right? That makes sense. Plants, trees, photosynthesis, sending photosynthates down that plant allocated to the roots where the fungi are. So therefore, the fungi are there to intercept the carbons, and there's their bonus, right? Okay, so there's their benefit right there. Um, so to return, though, fungi, they're different. They're not a plant. They have different enzymes involved that aids in nutrient cycling that may not be done by the plant itself, however, facilitated by the fungal organism that are associated with those plants' roots, allowing for the capture of nitrogen, of phosphorus, which is often very limiting in these forest settings, okay? So you have your mycorrhizae sending nutrients, okay, and then receiving carbon from the plant. And importantly, this is not a exception. This is a rule. Most plants out there are going to have some type of mycorrhizal symbiont. Forest trees, since we're looking or talking about forest restoration, will be primarily, not all the time, uh, there, there's also other, other uh, types of mycorrhizae, but primarily, and my focus will be ectomycorrhizal fungi. So ectomycorrhizal fungi, very characteristic is this fungal sheath that's on the outside of the root, okay, with that radiating hyphae. So that's your ectomycorrhizal. And what that does is it, it definitely provides greater access to nutrition, right, as explained before, and also water, which is another really limiting um, attribute or limiting uh, resource within our developing landscapes. Um, also, and this is important when we're restoring certain mine sites that may be heavy or high in heavy metals that are associated with coal, coal spoil pollution, okay? Mycorrhizae has this ability to help the plant, well, the plant can tolerate high metal soils by the mycorrhizal's ability to either A, sequester heavy metals within its own fungal body, or two, bind metals to soil particles within that soil profile, preventing that transfer of metals into the plant. So that's a great benefit, particularly on polluted sites. Another benefit to mycorrhizae is this idea of protection from soil-borne diseases, okay? And I want to make that really clear. Soil-borne diseases and not the above ground, but the soil-borne uh, because it's a fungus, right? And, and we can thank fungi for antibiotics, right, that we take. And, uh, so, so it's a natural secondary um, metabolite are these uh, secondary metabolite or these antibiotics that are produced by fungi. It really keeps other fungal organisms away or keep other bacteria away or any other microorganisms that might want a little bit of that carbon, right? Now that's, that's my carbon and it's able to defend other plant pathogens or other microbial entities within that soil profile from antibiotics. And remember, it has that nice fungal sheath, doesn't it, that goes around that root tip. That could also be a protective barrier against certain uh, pathogens that could be either both fungal bacteria, virus particles, or nematodes, also piercing nematodes. So it has been shown in the literature to have some protection from disease, but it's a definite beneficial attribute when we think of an establishing seedling on some of these sites. Really importantly, and I think this is such a neat attribute here, is this um, ability to provide networks. Okay, And what I mean by that it can provide a network to establish trees. So if you see the bottom uh, photo there, you're seeing a root system. And in the gold is primarily plant tissue. But all of that white that you're seeing is actually fungi. So you can really see how fungi maximizes the root system, thereby maximizing the ability of the plant to access water and nutrients, and also creates a network. And I know it's a little light in this room, but if you see this little germinating pine seedling here. Right off the bat, it germinates and taps into that existing network of hyphae that allows it to capture some of that excess nitrogen, phosphorus, water 
and it gets transferred carbon from the neighboring plant. So is that clear, that benefit of that network with regard to mycorrhizae? Okay, because I'll be coming to a point here later in the talk. So fungal mutualisms, they are a positive interaction in those ecosystems. Now let's look a little more on our fungal pathogens. These are disease um, organisms. But before we boo, hiss the diseases, let's talk about some of the beneficial um, characteristics of disease in ecosystems. They really facilitate plant diversity and forest structure. And a great example of that is velvet top fungi. And perhaps you've seen some of these fruiting bodies come out the side of a Sika spruce. Okay, so these spruces are magnificent. They're ancient, they're old. What kills them? Or in a way, at least on our time frame, they're a bit immortal. So what entity enters that ecosystem to remove an established large Sika spruce or an established large uh, fir tree? Well, it could be a pathogen called velvet top. It comes in and infects and it rots out both the buttress portion of the tree or the main stem of the tree, weakening the wood. And then what happens? A storm comes through, topples the tree, and that's a nice gap disturbance in a, in a, a forest, right? You have this gap disturbance, which means light and other nutrients that were otherwise unavailable are suddenly available. So you have this dynamic that is caused by the toppling of a large tree in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. Okay? We can see that pathogens are density dependent. Okay? That means as their host builds up in population, the disease then follows and builds up in population. Okay? So we can see plant diversity, really uh, this, this key feature of plant diversity in the tropics where you see in the soils around these mature trees you're going to find disease. And this disease is going to put pressure on their seedlings, ensuring that it's just not a monoculture or one tropical tree, but a diverse variety of trees, some that are resistant to disease, some that are just completely resistant to that fungus because it's an entirely different genus all on its own. And we're seeing this creation of plant diversity because we have a negative feedback pushing back on the most abundant species in that ecosystem thereby creating a diverse um, system for plants. So our structure can be diverse because of those gap dynamics. Our plant diversity can be increased. This becomes problematic when, right? We're trying to grow one plant for a crop, OK? Then you're going to have your problems with pathogens. And that's when they come to be a very negative entity. Agriculture and the timber industry, when you have one host, you're going to start to collect disease, okay? So that density dependent is a factor of that negative feedback. Importantly, fungi can be in the form of an invasive species. And that's what kind of gets into the pathogen that I'm going to be looking at, which is Cryphonectria parasitica, causal agent of chestnut blight. Again, it's a little light, but uh, Cryphonectria parasitica has these orange stroma that come pushing through the bark of a tree, and it, it's, it's powerful enough to completely destroy, well, listen to the story, the actual um, stand in North America. So chestnut blight was introduced on nursery stock of Chinese chestnut, on Japanese chestnut, probably in the 18, um, 1880s. They've tracked mail order catalogs where people started ordering these uh, non-native trees. Well, inadvertently, the trees, not only did, did Aunt Minnie get her Chinese chestnut, but Aunt Minnie also imported chestnut blight. That is in a fine balance with the Chinese and Japanese varieties of chestnuts because they co-evolved together. They had thousands of years where the pathogen would attack and select for the genetics that had genes to resist the pathogen attack. And then there's this attack, defend, attack, defend, co-evolutionary interaction that leads to breeding right, uh, or actually natural adaptation of genetic resistance within a population of trees. So your Chinese chestnut, Japanese chestnut, are not phased at all with chestnut blight. They can actually hang out with it. So chestnut blight inadvertently was imported into the United States because of, of, of nursery stock associated with the uh, horticulture industry. So when it came into the country, came into the east, it met the American chestnut that never saw this disease did not have the genetic resistance to fight off this disease 
and literally ran rapid throughout the forests of North America. So the native range or the natural range of chestnut is from Maine to really northern Florida. And it made up 25% of the eastern deciduous forests. In some areas, 50% of the eastern de uh, deciduous forests. And once it met that pathogen with no resistance, a prolific host, remember that de density dependence is important, and no genetic resistance meant the demise of the American chestnut. And it was fast. So by 1904, they detected chestnut blight in dying mature chestnuts in the Bronx Zoo. In the next 10 years, it was in the tri-state. And the next 20 years, it was in 13 states. And then by the 1950s, all of those chestnuts that were once there were extirpated in their native range. So it represented this large scale ecological disturbance that North America had really ever seen. And it paved the way to a lot of federal regulations that, that try to now um, prevent that importation from happening again. And I hope we can do that. So it was, it was a catastrophe, ecologically, culturally. Because American chestnut, think of what salmon mean to you. Okay, was that American chestnut sort of icon of food and habitat? And it was a keystone species. Lots of things fed off of it. Humans used it for timber. Human used it for food. So it was, it was definitely a devastational cultural icon and ecological keystone species that were wiped out. So we know where it was from. Fungal pathogen introduced on nursery stock. So there's that orange canker I was telling you about. Remember I said cankers could be really gentle and just mark the tree and the tree fights back and everything's okay. Or it could be very, very lethal. This is an example of no genetic resistance to a fungal pathogen that was introduced and it kills the tree very, very quickly. Produces this orange canker, okay? And then that's what it looks like when played it out. And we were able to trace those back to that introduction of Chinese and Japanese chestnut. So it is with enthusiasm that the American Chestnut Foundation, who put in a lot of resources and a lot of time to use this method, which is an agriculture method called back crossing. Okay, that's when you take, um, well, you literally cross two trees. And in this case, I'm just going to use my pointer here so I can just kind of direct. It starts out with the initial cross of an American parent with a Chinese chestnut parent. Now, notice the Chinese chestnut isn't a canopy tree, is it? It's a little tiny little orchard tree. And there might be some argument there for genetic resistances might have a trade-off, and that could be above ground biomass. So they're thinking that there's some theory out there. But regardless, Chinese chestnut is a wonderful nut-producing orchard tree, but it's not a canopy tree. So we can cross American chestnut with Chinese chestnut and get a hybrid. That's 50-50. But if you notice, the morphology is still not this canopy tree. And if we think we want to restore um, chestnut into the North American forests, we need blight resistancy, right? We need to make sure it has the genes to be resistant to the blight. And we also need to make sure it has the morphology to grow into a canopy tree, OK? And so the American Chestnut started Foundation, pardon me, started back crossing it. And they can get a hybrid. And what they do with the hybrids, then they punch a hole in it. They put cryphonectory in it. And the ones that die, out of the program. The ones that live then go on to back crossing. And back crossing is, is where you take the hybrid, you cross it again with a pure American chestnut, you begin to dilute the genes of the Chinese chestnut and increase the genetics of the American chestnut to where you have a tree that shows blight resistance, okay, with the morphology of a forest tree. And this was 20 years in the making, 20, 30 years to do this. So it's kind of comical now when SUNY comes to these meetings, they're like, yeah, we just take our gene gun and boop, and, and, and blast the gene right into the chestnut tree. So it's like, oh, OK, well, there's back crossing. But back crossing can do it right without a, a genetic modification of, of that's uh, uh, in it with the, the gene manipulation of the gene guns. So um, is that clear? So we can use back crossing to create a hybrid chestnut that looks like an American chestnut. And we hope, we hope punitive resistance to that disease. Any questions so far? A lot of little stories in my little fungal talk. OK, good. We're good. Excellent. OK, so we have this hybrid. We have North America. How in the world are we going to get all these trees out there, right? Because there's thousands of them. 
that have been produced. And we have no idea how chestnut's going to do in the 21st century. It's been out of the playing field for almost 100 years now, right? So how do we plant them? Where do we put them? And what do we do with them? Okay, one thing is forest restoration. So in pockets, we can put uh, American chestnut and American chestnut hybrids and begin to establish trees within the forest ecosystems. Or there's also mine reclamation. And that's, that's what I'm involved in here, uh, where chestnut, if you can see here, so here's the natural native range of chestnut, right? And it overlays just perfect of this Appalachian coal field right here. So wow, we have some very disturbed lands all throughout these mountains that used to contain chestnut. So we think, as restoration ecologists, that chestnut, being that it overlaps with that native range, and it has such fast growth rate and tolerance to dry soils. Tolerance to dry soils because the historic reference records show that it was on the rocky top tops of Tennessee, right? And all throughout North Carolina ridge tops. In areas where you're thinking, where's the soil, right? So this is, must be a tree that could really tolerate these dry, harsh conditions. Uh, fast nut production equates, and fast above ground growth, equates to habitat creation. And it does it really, really fast. At least it does in the orchards. So with these characteristics, we think, right, chestnut could become this really great coal mine reclamation tree. And we have plenty of lands to play with, right, all throughout the Appalachian areas. This is an example of one of the sites um, that I have some chestnuts growing. This is in eastern Ohio, and this is right on the foothills of, of the mountains. So, so it's a, a neat rolling hills area. But this used to be forest, OK? It was mined, and now it's just kind of sat like this for 30 years. This looks like scotch broom, doesn't it? Maybe. It's, it's, it's not as big as scotch. I couldn't believe how big your scotch broom gets. But this is called Lesbidiza cunata. It, it, I think it's a relative. Um, it, it, it's a legume. So it also has a mutualism, right? So it has this nitrogen fixing um, mutualism that aids in nitrogen production in the rhizome, right? It also has our buscular mycorrhizal fungi that helps in soaking up the phosphorus and the combination of the nitrogen phosphorus. Boy, this stuff grows. It grows and it doesn't let anybody else come in and play. Okay, so this is a great scenario called arrested succession where we try to restore these mine sites or at least restore them to be able to recover naturally and naturally by the successional trajectory from an early successional seedling onto a climax uh, canopy forest. But it's so difficult, right, because all the soil has changed. Invasive species have been uh, introduced. This is from China. And it's really tough to get that natural recovery through forest succession. So we have to think big, right? We have to think equipment. So this was fun, right? We got to bring in a bulldozer with a meter long steel shank to really rip up that highly compacted soil that was covered in Lesbidiza canata. So using what we, I, we're, all, we're all environmental science, environmental studies, right? We all have at least, we know what a plant is, right? And we know what to, a plant likes to, when, when it's planted. That's nice loose soil, right? It doesn't like compaction, especially your forest trees. So when we think of this as, as biologists, we, we think this is very intuitive, but it's anti-policy. So it's kind of like, ah, let's, let's uh, try to think about it on a biological standpoint and influence policy moving forward on these landscapes, which are highly compacted, so it needs some type of alleviation of that compaction. It still needs, right? So we want to make sure the substrate's appropriate, has soil at a decent pH for a forest tree, has loose soils so that forest tree can establish and root very deep, and proper ground cover. And that's harder than you think. We're playing with that right now. It's like, okay, what plant can we plant with the tree that will let the tree grow? And that becomes a very tough, because it's great to have forest trees all throughout these sites. But remember, it's going to take a couple years for a forest tree to establish and anchor into that soil and support the soil and to create the biomass that will interfere with the rain. So we'll have a soil erosion issue if we go with only solely trees. So what ground cover will play nice with our hardwood trees? We're still working on that bullet point there. And of course, proper planting methods don't plant it upside down, which I have volunteers all the time. It's like, nope, nope, roots this way, yes. So, or, or we'll rip up the soil. This is, this is, I love, this is fun. We'll rip up the soil, and they'll plant it here. And I'm like, no, 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 plant it there. Plant it. But, but that makes sense, right? We want to plant where it's pretty. 
Okay, so trees don't like it pretty, right? Trees like it rough and loose. So this forestry uh, reclamation approach allows us to set standards to reintroduce hardwood trees into areas that are just compromised with regard to compaction, invasive species, low nutrients, and of course, low organic matter in that soil. And low biological integrity. So you're not gonna find your mycorrhizae, right? So you're gonna have those missing. So when we reintroduce chestnut in the 21st century, okay, what exactly uh, will this tree interact with? Because we don't have the records. Uh, we do know it's an ectomycorrhizal tree host, right? So therefore, it's important to create some type of planting environment or tr planting methodology that will benefit both the tree and its fungal symbiont. Because if not, the tree's gonna die if that fungal symbiont is not cultured to survive. And remember that network I showed? We want to restore these mine sites by accelerating succession, meaning we have some early successional trees. Chestnut's unique because it's both early successional and late successional. It's a generalist. It can really adapt to any environment. But trees itself will create those networks of mycorrhizae, will add organic matter to the soil, will pave the way for other tree species to come and recruit, at least we think and we're restoring this using chestnut. So how does it do? Well, and what does it, uh, what does it uh, associate with? So we looked at field sampling for mycorrhizae. So we chose 120 seedlings to randomly come in and, and core, and this is just an example of their root system there. And once we got into the lab, we cleaned it up really well, and we counted it up uh, under the microscope, so we quantified root colonization, and then we took their pictures and described and vouchered what we were seeing. That's a, that's a long process there. I know there's mycorrhizae people in the room that can, can fare, uh, this is fun, right? But it's hard, to, like when mom calls, it's like, well, what are you doing? Never mind, <laughs> it's, a, it's a long, boring story, but uh, for us, it's very exciting. So we can clean them up, see who's who, how the, the mycorrhizal colonization, colonization is doing on the mine site, and then we can use uh, environmental DNA, essentially, DNA sequencing through a specialized primer mix, ITS region, which covers this entire region of the fungal uh, genomic DNA. And this is genes for ribosomal RNA, meaning there's lots of them okay, in that chromosome. So we have a target that just by nature, we're going to have a lot of copies of this within that genome, and we have primers that are selective enough so we can have plant material, bacterial material, fungal material, but our primers are sensitive enough to select for mycorrhizal DNA, okay, using this barcode here. And this barcode's robust enough because a lot of folks are using it and depositing their vouchered species, or um, pardon me, vouchered samples and sequences into a major database where you can actually go in with a sequence and query all these knowns and come up with your species. Now, I always, I always caution people though, right? Sequences without morphological identity, eh, right? And I even, I go so far to say, well, when I sequence and I pull from a database, I'm a little uh, hesitant to call it to species. For me, working on the general level or the genus level is just fine. So I, I'm interested in looking at the genus if I want to make sure I can quantify species diversity, we can do that through the use of phylogenetic trees. You can run your sequences against other sequences and it will build a phylogenetic tree that allows you to say, okay, yes, that puffball is different from that puffball. We have two species of puffballs, okay? So we can, by using this DNA sequencing and morphological identification, we can really start understanding the species that are also involved in succession of these mine sites. And everybody's little, I call this their, their um, yearbook picture, right? Is that, I tried Brady Bunch one time and every, no one knew what I meant. I was like, oh man, I'm getting old, right? Okay, so this, so this is their little, like I said, when mom calls and what have you been doing? Well, yeah. Anyway, so we had, uh, right, we had nine morphologies right off the bat. So, so, so pretty characteristic. And then when we sequenced it, we had about um, 14 species by the second year starting to collect on, on the trees. Some we know we brought in upon planting, and I'll talk more about that in another slide. Some uh, we realize that were native to the site. So just to kind of name a few, there's two sclerodermas, which are a puffball, A and B. Uh, there's also a nice uh, rushula, 
down at the end, and those are those common, you'll see them in the fall, different beautiful colors on top of their, their fruiting body. I forgot to mention, mushrooms in the forest, chances are they're mycorrhizal. Um, Hebeloma, and we have a thelophora or thelophora, depending on where you're from, and another um, thelophoraceae species here. Cortinarius, Cenococcum, which is a real interesting fungus, nice black uh, sheath there, and that gold sheath is pisolithus. So we saw right off the bat this sort of small collection of specialized fungi that are early successional, and they could quickly um, form meiosis that are functional in the field and provide that, those beneficial attributes. So right off the bat, when we're looking at different ways to prep the soil, as long as we prep the soil, we're getting great colonization from our fungi. The control is actually policy. So we really have to think about how we're reclaiming these mines, because if we reclaim them by policy, that's what you're going to get with regard to your mycorrhizal colonization. And if you look at your mycorrhizal colonization graph next to a tree growth graph, it's going to mirror that too. So policy is not growing forest trees. But folks are listening to us, and we're saying, this here, these methods here will. And that's a tall one. So uh, importantly, when we look at mycorrhizae uh, colonization on chestnut roots, as that goes up, as that increases on our roots, so does our seedling basal diameter, diameter at the trunk, which is a great measure because not only is it getting above ground biomass that the tree's producing, it's a great measure of maybe what's going on below ground too. So as your root systems get larger, your basal diameter does too. So that's correlated. So that's a great measure of, of tree growth here. No, I know a low R square value. It's a noisy system, right? But a positive interaction, I took it. All right. So to kind of look at these interactions early, um, it really isn't clear whether it's the mycorrhizal activity driving plant growth or if plant growth is contributing to this mycorrhizal colonization, right? But it doesn't matter because both, when we see this buildup of biomass above ground, we know this network is growing below ground, both are strong indicators of healthy tree establishment and the potential to facilitate other seedlings. So by year five, remember I told you it's fast, nut production and biomass production. We didn't think by year five it was going to have shade and chestnut burrs. So in those burrs are three chestnuts. So right up in five years, they're growing strong, producing forest uh, food, right? This is a protein source for all the mammals and avian species in the forest pocket. So this is good. By year five, chestnut blight came back. We didn't even introduce it to the system. It just naturally came back. And that's about right. When the chestnut begins to flower, it tends to also become susceptible to chestnut blight. We don't know if it's because, again, it's a trade-off in reproduction allocation to reproduction and a decrease in allocation for fighting off a pathogen, or if it's just these growth spurts where chestnuts growing, bark's cracking, and those are those entry wounds for the pathogen. Either way, we saw cankers come back in year five, we documented them, and we also took little bark plugs out so we could plate them and say, yes, that's definitely Cryphonectria parasitica. These other cankers that we're seeing are not rearing Cryphonectria parasitica, so we think we have a good idea to who's susceptible to chestnut blight and who's not. So in comparison to our field site where we had Pure American planted out, just really for control, right? We also had two different types of hybrids. And the great news is it was really primarily the pure American chestnuts that had these cankers after five years. And the hybrids were displaying some pretty good field resistancy. And that was great to see, okay? So we'll follow these through time and see if they maintain that resistance over the years. But that, so we're still working on it. So that brings me to this question. So I've been working on this this year. Does disease influence mycorrhizal fungi, or ECM, ectomycorrhizal fungi? Fungal mutualisms are driven by carbon, right? That was the very, that's the trade. I'll give you water, I'll give you nutrients, you give me some sugar, right? A little money for my sugar or something. So we know carbon is the big driver of this, this mycorrhizal. So if we have a canker causing disease, right, that's either going to kill the host in some or is going to take half of its biomass. So here's a little canker coming off one of the side shoots and this is a canker. You're losing half your biomass, right? You would think that that removal of that photosynthetic tissue 
will influence root colonization and mycorrhizal species colonization. At least that's our hypothesis, that we'll have this loss of carbon. And whether it's either A, the fact that you lost carbon, okay, or you lost the ability to produce carbon, or B, you're losing above ground biomass. So what do you think that plant is doing with its available carbon? It's probably not sending it to the roots right then, right? It's probably sending that carbon above ground to try to put on new above ground biomass to compete with others around them for the sun. Okay, so that limiting resource will guide the carbon direction within that plant. So our hypothesis, and well, if we're seeing these canker cars and uh, pathogens within our site, then is that going to impact our colonization that we've been working on for the last few years? And is that going to influence an ability of a neighboring seed to actually uh, become established? So our question here is, does the disease status of an existing tree influence colonization and establishment of a new mycorrhizal species, or ectomycorrhizal tree seedling? How are fungal communities changing in the early successional habitats? We're on year five, six, and seven here. The ectomycorrhizal attributes, um, are they maintained with this host dynamics when there is tree disease within our site? So what we did is we found three types of trees, okay? Ones that were dead, that was easy to find, okay? So the dead trees, they were one of our trees. The disease trees, where they had 50% disease dieback in the field, we found 25 of those, 25 of those, and 25 healthy trees without disease at all, okay? So with each of our little trees that were designated either healthy, dead, or disease, we planted a little companion seed right next to that, okay? Thinking that there's networks, there's mycorrhizae inoculum there with that established tree, what is the impact of disease going to have on the survival and establishment and nutrient dynamics of that tree? So does that make sense at this point? I know it's getting a little later in the talk, but okay, so we had different, either it was healthy without a canker, it had a canker, it lost 50% of its biomass, or it died in the field and we're not sure what it died from, okay? Each of those were replicated 25 times with a little we let the seedling grow up for five months. We dug it up and we took a look at both the community composition of the seedlings and also the community composition of the trees. So let's look at the trees, okay? So disease status notwithstanding, we're just looking at community composition. After year two, we had this Hebeloma in Cortinarius, which was the most abundant species in our site. And the interesting thing was, is we actually inoculated our, our seedlings with P. Solithus didn't quite take, but we had inadvertently uh, introduced Hebeloma and Cortinarius onto our site. Made of fungi, it wasn't a problem at all. In fact, it helped with plant establishment over time. After year five, what we saw is a complete disappearance in Hebeloma, and then this abundance grow in our Cortinarius species and our little Cenococcum species. And if you look at the differences in our fungal hyphae, we went from a very fine hyphal species here to those with very coarse hyphae or melanized type hyphae, being that this would be more of a carbon, um, I would say carbon sink for the host plant than the hebeloma. But it was worth it because we're getting this above ground biomass, enough carbon to send to the roots to, to support these more carbon intensive species here. Good news is when we're looking through time, we're having this average root colonization grow from about 44% to 58%. And to give you an idea, forests are about 100% mycorrhizae. Okay, so we're on our way to this uh, colonization of our, our trees with this quaternarius dominant uh, species. So when we compared our tree types from those that had dieback versus those that didn't have dieback, we did get a significant difference, and this is what we had predicted, and this was not a big mystery either, right? We lose carbon, we lose that carbon allocation to the roots, we lose our mycorrhizae. So our disease trees had significantly less mycorrhizae on them, and this translated into a loss of an ability to inoculate their companion seed. 
So the healthy trees were really able to inoculate their seedling really, really well up above the 50% mark where we lost a little ability to inoculate and then in the dead trees we got very little inoculum. So health of tree did matter with regard to facilitating inoculation on that new seedling. When we look at seedling size by established trees, here's our healthy trees. They were by far the tallest and thickest, both basal diameter, nice thick leaves. And we think, well, wow, not only did they get inoculated, but they probably tapped into that existing mycorrhizal network that allowed that healthy neighboring tree to share its resources, particularly carbon that was driving from that healthy tree onto that developing seedling. But it took a, a definite hit. So if the trees were diseased or if the trees were dead, it definitely lost sort of that growth vigor that was associated with the healthy trees. And significantly, and, and a bit surprisingly, if you were a little seedling and you were growing next to a diseased tree, this had nothing to do with the chestnut flight, because remember, they had to be about age five or six to really catch the disease, they were dying. So we had very, very low survival next to the diseased trees, and this was significant when we actually compared it to the healthy tree and the dead tree. So yes, your neighbor does matter if you're, in a, if you're an establishing seedling on these coal mine sites. Should look familiar, doesn't it, Shannon? Most boring slide ever, but uh, here. There we go, not so boring anymore. Okay, so looking at the foliar nutrition of our micronutrients and our macronutrients, what we did find is that, it, remember, it's a quaternarius dominant system. So if they were associated with quaternarius within those first um, few months of establishment, they had significantly um, more carb, or pardon me, more nitrogen in the foliage tissue of those little seedlings. So they had greater access to nitrogen facilitated by quaternary species. And this was interesting as well. We looked at aluminum and we looked at copper. Now, these weren't normal ranges. They were actually quite higher and we thought they might be. So aluminum was high and copper was high. So we have this negative correlation between mycorrhizae, quaternarius mycorrhizae, and aluminum and copper. So in, in a sense, that you're having this less accumulation of, of aluminum and copper in these little seedlings, and that was still relatively in the high range for, for copper and aluminum acquisition. So there is some buffering effect from quaternarius. And if we compare the quaternarius species uh, that were associated with chestnut to the other mycorrhizae that were just non-quaternarius, we lost that, that positive correlation to nitrogen and we also had a little gain of this negative correlation between copper. So if it was mycorrhizae, it was helping the seedling establish in high copper soils without any type of damage. So that was a good thing. But if it had quaternarius, it was aiding in establishment and nitrogen acquisition in the system. So we know, right? Why inoculate with pisolithus, right? Why not inoculate with quaternarius off the bat and try to really get this established in these, these signs? So save a few bucks in the nursery. So in summary, okay, so what we're finding, again, this is a young site, this is, this is early succession, and we're able to document the first seven years of this establishment. We're seeing this increase in mycorrhizae over time, ECM mycorrhizae, and species are changing, right? And we believe that the selection of these species are being driven by these limiting resources. Nitrogen is very low in our system, despite that lesbidiza, it's almost undetectable in the system. So nitrogen is a limiting resource. Quaternarius has the enzymes to forage and degrade organic matter, transferring those nitrogens into the plant. So the plant then is facilitating the growth of the quaternarius by sending that carbon to the root system because the limiting resource in that case will be below ground. Okay, so that carbon system is driving the selection of quaternarius. We did see that disease decreases after mycorrhizal colonization and that ability to facilitate the establishment of another tree. We did not see differences in community composition. It was all pretty much quaternarius. So quaternarius is the most abundant species, but I'm thinking as these uh, trees continue to die back, we're gonna lose quaternarius in some of the trees, and then what? We're taking out an abundant species. Disease, again, is taking out an abundant species, this time not above ground, below ground, right, allowing for more niche space 
for other species. So I anticipate on our disease trees that we'll actually have an increase in species diversity, and this has been of our of our ectomycorrhizal fungi, and that has been shown in, in certain disease settings um, in other studies. So I think we'll have an increase in mycorrhizal niche space. However, we're going to see the limiting resource drive the most abundant species. Okay. And lastly, uh, ectomycorrhizal colonization was correlated with an increase in nitrogen and a decrease in metals when associated with that quaternarius. Um, chestnut blight's going to drive the selection of our genotypes there in the field that have blight resistance. That's great. At year seven and eight, I'm glad we're knocking the weak genomes out of our system. And they're starting to flower and produce seed. We want that flower and seed to be resistant to have this sustainable population. And lastly, mortality from blight will create nutrient pools, right, that possibly could, we're going to sample next summer, facilitate tree diversity. So we anticipate in these areas where chestnuts dying back, it's paving the road, though, for other species to be deposited, and we should see a diverse system building in the next few years. So the jury's still out. Okay, so I thank you all for your attention, and uh, I always tell my students, be, make sure you're outstanding in your field. It's the worst pun ever, I know, but get out there, <laughs> see the changes that are occurring, uh, make sure you document them, and even the little uh, small entities or puzzle pieces of our restoration site become very important with regard to the interactions with the host plants. So thank you all so much for your attention.